All right. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Phil. Um, I know I've met many folks in the room, but I'm a community involvement coordinator from Region 5. Um, and this is, you know, our fourth info session we're doing. And thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we have Bill from Ohio EPA. He's going to be doing a, a presentation on surface water. Some uh, quick kind of format. We're going to do the presentation. Um, then we're going to go into Q&A, uh, focus on the presentation, and then we'll open it up for more general Q&A. And then uh, we'll hang around afterwards if you all have additional questions or want to talk to us one-on-one -on -one and whatnot. Um, also for next week, you know, because of, of your interest and, um, and what we're hearing from the community, we are going to have a public health session with folks from uh, ATSDR as well as local and state uh, health departments. So just letting everyone know, we'll be here next Thursday, same location, um, same time uh, with, with all those folks. Um, so look forward to seeing folks next week again as well. And uh, Mark also mentioned he does have some follow-up to some questions for last week, so he will uh, talk about those tonight as well. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it over to Bill. Um, so if it's okay with everyone here, if we turn this light out, it'll cut down on the nasty reflection, so you might see things a little better. So my name is Bill Zawiski. Uh, I am the supervisor of the water quality group at Ohio EPA in the district that includes this area. So that we call it in our world, it's a Northeast District office. Um, I've been working at Ohio EPA since 1989. So I've been on a couple of surveys down here and other places. So my goal is to share with you, one, how Ohio EPA asks the stream the question of how you're doing. And then some of the stuff we did see uh, from a survey, and we'll talk a little more about that. And then hopefully hit on a few things. I know I'm not going to hit on all your questions, so please uh, formulate them and ask me what I missed. But I'm going to try and give you a, a general overview. When I saw the out information sheet, I tried to touch on the things that were listed there. So first off, um, the little maps are the exact same as this, as the same as this. This is the Be Little Beaver Creek watershed. It just so happens that last year, Ohio EPA was in and assessed the water quality of the Little Beaver Creek watershed. So uh, in relation to the event here, we have very current data to say what it was like before the, the spill happened. So that's everything we look at is going to compare future results with what we found in 2022. In the corners, kind of talks about the different things we do, and I'll talk about those right now. So Ohio EPA focuses on a host of different things to ask a water body, how you doing? And we look at things we call stressors, and those are like the wastewater treatment plant has a permit to discharge to the Leslie Run with us. Well, we review their data. How have they been? We inspect those places. How have they been? Are there any other issues? So if we did this survey in 2024 or this summer, Obviously, spills would be a big deal, and we would take that into account in our survey in asking that question. We look at other things, uh, the exposure. So what's the chemistry? All of our surveys, we do a lot of chemistry sampling, similar to what's going on today, or in, that's been going on as part of this. We do toxicity. We look at the sediment quality and fish tissue, because ultimately, if you consume the fish, we want to make sure you're eating fish that are healthy. And there's, there's a consumption index. Any sport fisherman, there's that Ohio sport fishing guide that tells you, are you limited to this many meals of this kind of fish? So all the data we collect feeds into those reports, not necessarily Ohio EPA stuff. And then the cool part of our job is we ask the stream directly based on the fish communities and what we call macroinvertebrates or bugs that live in that stream because a chemistry test is I throw a bucket off the bridge. In Ohio, we've learned to tie a rope to the bucket. It works so much better. But you pull the bucket back, you are getting a sample of that water at that very moment in time. Over a lot of samples, that tells a story, and that's a good story. But if there's a single event that happens, the chance that you are there at that very moment is very unlikely. So the fish and the insects that live in that stream are there their entire life. So if something is going on, they're going to tell us what's happening 
in addition to the other points of information. So we have a really broad way of, of looking at a watershed. So we'll talk about some of the different ways we assess stuff. We look at these fish communities. In an Ohio and in any other state that does this kind of work, we electrofish. And I've been doing this for a long time, and this is one of the most fun things we do. You hit the stream with some electricity, and if a fish is in a 10-foot range of you, it's coming up to the surface, and you net it, and we do a zone. In the Leslie Run, for example, a zone would be about 200 meters. And in that 200 meters, we are collecting every fish that pops up. And then when we're done with that zone, we are going to identify, weigh, if necessary, and count all those fish. And then that informs us to a score, a rating for that stream. And we have different kinds of techniques we use. So for example, in Little Beaver Creek, where it gets big and deep, we're going to use a boat. In parts of Leslie Run and, and most of the rest of the watershed, we'll typically use something we call wading. This is a generator, a big bucket we call a live well, and then someone in front that's actually putting an electric current in the stream. So there's a positive at the end of the net, and then this entire boat is wired as the negative. So around there is current, the circle of electricity. And anything in there will catch. And in the headwater streams, which are small ones, we, we do a different technique. But they're all asking the same question, who's living here? And the fish, it's, it's almost when you're done with the zone, even before you score it, you can kind of get an idea of what's really going on in that stream. We have what we call an index of biotic integrity or an IBI, but what it is, is think of it as a bunch of classes and in the end result it's your grade point average. So each of these, we call them metrics, says how many different kinds of fish are here, how many kinds of darters are here, because each of these has a different role to play in a healthy stream e ecosystem. So we're asking these questions of a stream, we write all this information down, and in the end we publish a score of, of what that ends telling us. And, and we'll kind of continue on to where this is. This started, Ohio EPA was really one of the first states in the country to start employing biological assessment. And it really allows us to ask questions that chemistry, as I said before, it's that moment in time, it allows us to really integrate with what's going on in the stream. So there's some cool fish in the stream, so for us, if you're a fisherman, a good smallmouth bass or a good northern is the fish you want to get. Well, for us, a darter or my favorite fish, the hog sucker, those are things that also tell us stories. So both of these like to hang out in really, really clean water. And if we start not seeing them, then in turn, it's like, well, what's going on? That leads us to more questions of asking things of the watershed. But we find all these, these different fish and for, for us, the Little Beaver Basin, and along with the, your neighboring watershed to the South Yellow Creek, are two of the nicest watersheds in the state of Ohio. For insects, so we said we talked about fish, we do the same thing for the insects. We put these little, we call them bug hotels if you want, put them in the stream, and all the insects will hang out there. And the reason we use things like this is if you add it up, the square inches of this, it is one square meter. So someone has a table saw and they cut lots of these, thousands of them every year to make these, and that gives us the ability to compute density. So it allows us to do math. But we also go through and we'll do identification. So right now, what we did last year is we did both artificial substrates and then someone just walking up a stream with the net and our protocols collecting all those insects. Over the winter, they identify, because their entire winter is spent under a microscope looking at all this stuff. And then we'll start publishing what those results are. Just like with the fish, had a grade point average. We, for the invertebrate index, we have a grade point average. This index was actually developed by Ohio EPA, and countries all over the world now use this. So out of Northeast Ohio, a professor at the University of Akron, actually one of his grad students came up with this. And so this is a very local Ohio thing. 
that now other states have employed over the years. And the bugs tell us a story because they're hanging out there all the time. Most of the insects that you get in a stream are baby bugs. So the adults, if you're a fly fisherman, stonefly, caddisfly, mayfly, those are things you tie flies for. Well, those baby insects will grow. Like in the case of a mayfly, they may live for a week or a couple of days and they die. Their entire main part of their life cycle is spent as a juvenile in the stream. We look at the habitat. So we're asking a stream, do you have the structure, the places that fish want to hang out? Do you have the places that bugs want to hang out? So we have something called the, we abbreviated the QHEI, the Habitat Evaluation. Another thing developed and invented by someone at Ohio EPA that's now used globally. But if you just, you don't even think about it. If you, if you fish, you already employ the QHEI as how you fish, right? You're not going to fish for fancy smallmouth here, you're going to pick a stream that has nice pools and has places that they're going to hide. So it's, if you think of visually, which one might have the higher score? And, and that all we're doing is using a sheet, and as we walk up and down the stream, we categorize and collect the information that we're seeing. Are there big boulders in the stream? Are there lots of plants, logs? These things all matter if you're looking at, does it have the structure to support these communities? Because you may have absolutely great water quality, but you may not have the physical structure. That could be the result of us dredging a stream, could be the result of stormwater running really fast down a stream and scouring it out. There's all different things that cause these impacts, but it's all integrated. So what we're looking at is a sum total of what goes on in a watershed and what do we find as far as information? So we do write big boring reports. If you want to read one, this thing called the total maximum daily load is based on our surveys that we've done. We say what's good about the watershed, what could be better about the watershed, and what really needs to be improved. And in a document like this that is approved by the US EPA, we're telling folks this is what we found and this is what we think needs to happen. The good thing about the bulk of the Little, creek, or the Little Beaver Creek Basin is it's pretty darn good. So these, these reports for places like this are actually very simplistic. It, there may be a sewage plant that needs to upgrade. There may be an area that has septic tanks or farm fields that need some better control. And then we say, hey, let's get some better farming practices. But we do that, Ohio EPA, comprehensively looked at this watershed in 1985. It was one of the first ones we assessed when we started doing this in 1999 and then recently last year. So again, we have current information as a baseline to track the recovery, first the impact and then the recovery of what's going on here. Ohio EPA was the first state in the country to make these fish surveys and bug surveys legal numbers. So we actually have a criteria. So if you think of a speed limit, if you go over a speed limit, you're violating that rule. Well, in our world, if you have less than this number based on how your stream is classified, you are not meeting the standard. So in Ohio, this makes it a, a, a much more strict way of looking at the quality of a stream. If we look at this Exceptional is like the, the streams that are coolest in, in, the, in the state, and that score is 50. Things like North Fork, Little Beaver Creek, Bull Creek, and Little Beaver Creek, parts of those streams are exceptional. When we did the, the average score for the fish communities, because the bug stuff's still rolling in, the average score for the fish communities was 50. So on average, the entire Little Beaver Creek watershed is pretty incredible. So that, that's a, that's, in our world, that's really good. So that's a good thing. Last year, this is what we found. And eventually, when we do a report, is, this will be all integrated into a report. These are, what I did is I followed the, the path of the spill. right? So Leslie Run, Bull Creek, North Fork, and Little Beaver Creek. And we had. Some sites that were upstream, some sites that were downstream. 
So in, in Leslie, for example, we do not have an upstream site. We have, this is right downstream where Sulphur Run comes in, so right by the sewage plant, and this is down in Negley in, near the mouth. But if you look at these scores, that's a pretty darn good score. That's almost perfect. That's out of 60. And we'll go back and what it used to be like, so some of the improvement. But just look at, you have Bull Creek here, has bad one, but it's got really bad habit, habitat. So I'm guessing someone dredged the snot out of a stream up there, and there's a reason that it has, doesn't have the structure for the fish to think it's a cool place to hang out. But the rest of this stream, the whole watershed was pretty cool. So this is last year, remember, this is not this year. Our survey season, we have a time to do this. It is June 15th through October 15th. So that will be happening again this year. So what we're, we're working with, how we're designing that, that plan, but we are expecting every one of these sites to be resurveyed again this year to see where they track against this and in, into the future. Because our goal is we need to have these communities not impacted and we know where they were. So we will, we will work to, to find out where they are and then what do we need to do to get them where they were. But again, this is, this is when you look at these scores, it's for, for, in my world, in the dorky biology world, this is a pretty cool stream. We look historically back. Now, there were some copies of the presentation. So if you don't have your binoculars out, it's a North Fork, but if you look at Leslie Run in 1999 and 1985, the scores, right where we got a 44 at the sewage plant, it was a 16. So it's like getting an F. So there were all kinds of impacts from wastewater treatment plants, from runoff, from how the community treats the stream. Those things had tremendous impacts in 1985. When you see 1980, 1999, things are starting to get better. This is a consistent pattern we are seeing across the state of Ohio, where over time, as we upgrade sewage plants, we have unsewered areas that really need to be sewered. We have better regulation of dischargers, be it an industry or a wastewater plant. We see these improvements that tells us, because of the way we ask these questions, things are getting better. And this is consistent across the state of Ohio, which is a very good thing. Other things we look at are chemistry. So as part of the response of the spill, there's a lot of sampling going on. We did a lot of sampling last year, and just some general things. I'll just So Ohio has standards for not everything. So not everything that was associated with this spill is something we have a standard for. And those things have to now be developed by the whole ecology team that's working on this to say what is an equivalent that is needed to protect the stream. And we're working on that. But for those things we do have standards for, let's just look at some of the stuff we do. We look at nutrients in a stream. We look at the hardness. So how much, you know, if you have hard water at home, it's the same thing we're doing here. And it, it matters because if you have something like, let's say, lead or zinc in the water, if you have a very soft stream, so it's acidic, that metal is more available to the fish and the bugs. And so our standards kind of grade based on hardness. If we look at dissolved solids, so think of your backwash from your water softener. That's very saline, very a lot of salinity. So we see those impacts. These are still pretty good. But we'll take this one. So let's take ammonia. We're going to go look at one of our tables. If you're ever really bored and you want to read our water quality standards, have at it. But there's a table in there, and it talks about ammonia. And what's it say? Well, go look at another table. And since I have the projector and the flipper, this is what one of our tables looks like. So what should your appropriate ammonia standard be? Well, let me tell you. You look at the temperature of the water and the pH of the water, and you figure out where the two intersect, and that is the appropriate standard because both pH and temperature affect the toxicity of ammonia to critters in the stream. So a lot of things are graded. So there, that's what it's, 
It's, if you say today, I got this ammonia level, is it bad? My first thing is, well, what was the pH and temperature? <laughs> because those are things that we need. I mean, there's some numbers, so if you look at the highest number, it's 13. So if you go downstream and say, hey, it was 20, I'm like, well, I know that's bad. But the rest of it is we have to do all this integrated looking. So the standards can be really complex. So if anyone has questions about it, we're here to help you through them. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, that bad of me for not saying that. So RM is our fancy term for river mile. So river mile zero is where a stream enters another stream. And then we have these things called river mile maps. So this would have been back in the 1980s. Our interns were bored, and we said, get a ruler out. And every tenth of a mile, you put a line on these river. So every topographic map in the state of Ohio has every stream with these tenth mile hash marks. And for us, it's a place. It's like an address on a stream. If you discharge here, and DA is drainage area. So from that point, just like in your bathtub, the drainage area that goes down the drain is anything that hits in the bathtub. That point, it's all the watershed that drains to it. It matters to us because when I talked about the fish, I said there were boat sites, wading sites, and headwater sites. Well, a headwater stream has different biological expectations than a big stream. We're not going to expect to find a four-foot muscalunge in a stream that's three inches deep. So our scale slides or our expectations of streams are based on that. So the drainage area is really important in answering that question. So yeah, I'm sorry, R River Mile drainage area. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, back on. <laughs> so yeah, we use those all the time. I don't even think about it, sorry. So as part of this specific spill activity here, these are all the sites that are being sampled. They are sampled these sites are in the direct area that was a spill. They do not discharge. All this water and all these results here are collected. But it tells us what's going on in that area. And all of this is really in the sulfur run beginning. We go down into Bull Creek, North Fork, Little Beaver, and we even have an upstream downstream site in the Ohio River. Those sites are sampled every day at all these sites, and if it rains, they're sampled twice. <laughs> so when you go back and look at the amount of information, and these are sampled for what we call a complete organic scan. So there's all the chemicals in addition to the stuff that was associated with the spill. It's part of this broad spec survey. And when this, when this, yeah. So the EPA, so in the case of the surface water, CTEH is an environmental toxicology company that developed the plan. There's a, another consultant group that collects the samples, a lab that analyzes the samples, and then a third-party lab that does what we call validation. So they make sure Ohio EPA, in the case of surface water, is not doing the sampling. No, nor, uh, consultants and the laboratories. I went through this research at the river. I don't know if they wanted me to sign a piece of paper. They wanted me to sign a piece of paper that said that I allowed Norfolk Southern right. and their associates and contractors into my home. Yes. That bothered me that that said Norfolk Southern. They might be a contractor, but who pays them? Norfolk Southern does. How do you want us to take these results seriously when you're letting the person that did this be the ones that test it? Well, in my world in doing this, this is the standard way we address stream surveys. Because if we look at, so, so in the bigger picture, let's, let's ask this bigger question. They're sending it to a lab that is analyzing it. If Ohio EPA collected these samples, we would be sending them to the same Laboratory. Are they, are they being collected the right way? How do we? Yes, know that? What, we go with them and we watch these things. So 
Part, mm -hmm. part of all these, regardless of who's sampling, part of our job, be it US EPA or Ohio EPA, <laughs> is to run alongside these folks. So I'm sorry if you don't like it. That's the way it is, and, and that's the way we're going to deal with it right now. But didn't, when they came in to do my air sampling again, there was someone from the EPA with them. What we've learned since then, Mark said it himself at our meeting, was that wasn't sufficient testing. So the EPA was with CTEH when they came in my home and tested my air at a higher level than they should have been testing. They weren't testing to see if our houses were safe and the EPA was right next to them. Okay. Yeah, so Jamie, what, what I'd recommend, because uh, Bill's got a lot of information to share and I'm, I'm happy to address the questions. Um, well, we're both happy to address the questions afterwards, but I, I'd like him to just get through the, the, the data part of it and then we can talk. Okay. I appreciate the information and, and how you're gathering it, but I'm, I'm kind of, I'm with Jamie here because if you are, you guys are not, you're conducting this meeting, where are they at? And they are paid by Norfolk Southern. And if anybody here is familiar with how a home gets constructed, a general contractor hires his subs, his plumbers, his HVAC guys, his electricians, if they badmouth the GC, they're out of a job. And these, these contractors work for Norfolk. They get the results Norfolk wants, not necessarily what might be accurate. And I, I know you guys are going to say this is the way that it's done. However, for a moment, step out of your EPA gear and put yourself as an EP resident and you have to be fearful because so far, Norfolk has not been transparent, not been accountable, and not been honest. And they're, they're not treating us warm and fuzzy like they're worried about how this is going to end. And we're all very concerned. So we're here to hear what you have to say. And I think we're all here because we need information number one but deep down we want reassurance so that that's why we're here and when you say you guys aren't actually conducting the testing they are that's not reassuring and and linda your your points are well taken and i i think there might be some value into talking about having one of these information sessions down the road we again we're, we're doing the public health one next week at your request Yes. Um, and maybe another one down the road to talk about these these types of coordination issues. I'd, I'd be happy to look into that. Okay. So we we get it. I mean, I, I totally understand. Another question, another question. But so, you know, I went and checked the trace almost every couple of days, okay? Down at the bottom of Negley, or down, down at the bottom of the hill going in, into Negley at that little pull-off where you guys had the things. Now, three days, I'd say four days ago, there was not a minnow, a minnow, in that little pool down there. I went there yesterday, and there was four carp, and I've fished these cricks my whole life. I've walked up and down them. I haven't found a helger mite in probably 10 years in this creek, but there was four carp as long as my arm, and there was, I haven't seen a horned chub in this creek in probably a couple years. It had, you can see these chubs, there was thousands, thousands of horned chubs, darters, and four carp, like I said, as long as my arm down there, and three days before there, there wasn't nothing in there. I got videos of the carp being in there. Three days, I got the video that there wasn't a thing in there. Somebody stalked that creek, and this is my question. Did somebody stalk that creek to see about environmental health on them, or what's going on? Because there was not no tubs or carp in that creek. They didn't flow down, they didn't flow down the creek, I know that because these carp are used, and that's shallow all the way down to that one spot. I, I just, it, it's, this is why I'm saying, like I said, I fished these cricks, and this, this was a little disturbing to me because three days before that, there wasn't nothing in that creek. Yes, yeah, so I'd like uh, Bill to answer your question, but I really would like to have him finish 
his presentation. I think it's important that you hear all of his information. You don't have that much left to do, do you? No. I yeah. So. We're yeah, and then and we can get into it, Jake. I, no, it's important. It's important that we uh, address the question. So, uh, so Bill. I'll, I'll, if I don't get to it when I'm done, remind me again. So anyway, so these are the sites. Now the reality of, I mean the, these are numbers. Results are numbers. And while you may say someone is working for the railroad, which they are employed, they also work for other clients. And believe me, if a lab does something wrong and gets caught, Norfolk Southern is the least of their worries. It's US EPA coming in and taking away their accreditation. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into this, but I'm sorry, we can, and, and if, we, if we work together, yeah, you want us to go sample this? We can sample it sometimes, and we're, I can, our results are going to be similar. I'm, I'm, that's. So, well, and the thing is, that, that's what I said. A lot of these tests, because these chemicals were not part of the normal, we call it a suite of samples, our labs are not geared up to do it. The commercial labs are much more nimble in responding to this. So if we sampled, our stuff would go to the same lab. We would just mark it A and mark it B. So if you want, even though you don't like the results, it, Ohio EPA's website is tracking all the results from these tests as they come in. So uh, on the top flag of our website is uh, East Palestine. If you click it and you go down, it talks about surface water results. There is a, a interactive map. So if you choose, you click that and it takes you to an, another site within our, our website that mimics, so it's the same sites. And this is where I always get screwed up because I'm not always super computer friendly. There's a little symbol down here and there's a symbol up here. You click that with your mouse and what it's going to do, it's going to allow you to click on a point. And that point is now going to pull up a bottom part and it's going to have all the parameters that we are tracking. And for any one of these sites, this happens to be Sulphur Run, the downstream site, it's going to track what those results are. We get them, as soon as we get those validated, we only enter data in this that has gone through that third party review. It's all posted down here. For purposes, vinyl chloride is one Ohio has a water quality standard for. I added this green line here. This is our water quality standard. Obviously, there was the release. Stuff went down the stream. What we're seeing now is the results are consistently below detection. So in the surface water, much of the stuff we are not seeing anymore in the downstream locations. The area of sulfur run, we still do get some, we call them hits, but you still get results. Still very low, but they are still things, as Mark said, we're still, there's still stuff and there's still reasons to be working in sulfur run. We are not seeing that similar stuff in the water chemistry downstream in Leslie Run to the Ohio. So big question, and I'll get back to what is next. We'll talk a little bit about each one of these. Sediment cleaning in Leslie Run. So around the wastewater plant, we're washing the sediment to try and live, because just the way this stuff settles, it settles in the sediment. You liberate it, you collect it. They've been doing that the last two days, and I must say in watching it, I was pleasantly disappointed. <laughs> I expected a lot of material to be sequestered in the sediment, and it, it's not there. Does that mean there's no sheen? Does that mean there's not material there? No. But when they're, when they're churning up this sediment to collect stuff coming out, it is not at levels I truly expected to be there. So in the big picture, that's a good thing. Many of these chemicals, what we're looking at is they have what they call half-life, so they biodegrade naturally, some in hours and some to, I think the one is 40 days. So in 40 days, you'll have half of what was there when it started. So Mother Nature does take care of some of this. In our world, we call that natural attenuation. 
Sediment cleaning in Leslie Run right now is going to go down to the end of the sewage plant. That's what we're looking at. We walked Leslie Run from the turnoff at the bottom of the hill all the way up to the wastewater plant. So in river mile terms, that's river mile 1.9 to river mile 3.3. There is still material. If you flip some of those, it's getting hung up under the big slabs. So the, the, the rocks are maybe dinner plate sized and flat. If you flip some of those, there is still stuff underneath there. But when I first came here in February, if you'd walk in the stream, no matter where you step, there were massive amounts of sheen that came up. You're not seeing that anymore. So that, that is a good thing. The question we are going to ask is, what is that right now doing to the stream? So the chemistry sampling will continue. We're going to go back and look at the biology again, because in our world in Ohio, the biology is the final arbiter of stream quality. So that is how our system is set up. We ask the biology what's going on. Do I know at this time? No. We walked up the stream. There are minnow schools up and down the stream. All the way up, we were finding uh, striped shiners. We got a, a bunch of them. I only had a little net, so we weren't catching them. As far as your thing is f of fish not being there and being there, this is a very typical thing we see because we had a spill. So we know Leslie Run had a very extensive fish kill. So for our purposes, we can say the entire stream from where it comes in at River Mile 3.37 to where it hits Bull Creek. We can pretty confidently say every fish pr probably died in that, in that stretch of stream. Does that mean that stream is never going to come back? Absolutely not. We see this at spill after spill after spill that we go to. Upstream in Bull Creek, there is populations of fish, and they're going to move back in. So fish coming back is not, not, we see that all the time. The fact that carp, I'm sorry that carp are hanging out there because they're one of those more pollution tolerant fish we don't like to see. Oh. Yeah, but they'll, they'll move. And, and the, so the response is, and this is one thing we got to watch for, is if these things like carp, and the stream is generally too small as you get further up to support carp, but we don't want the carp to kick out other fish that are more pollution sensitive. But my, my guess, because I've been doing this for a long time, this is what we're going to see in the fish communities. It'll get reassessed this year. I bet Bull Creek all the way down will be back to meeting these numbers because upstream it went into a stream and it went down. It went into a stream, went down. Upstream, all these fish communities didn't get affected by anything. And they're going to re remove. So I think that's going to happen. Leslie Run, I can pretty much look at, at the lower parts. And we can say, is it going to hit that 54, that really cool score? I don't know. <laughs> but do I think it's going to recover to the point of where it meets exceptional again? Yes. As we go further up in Leslie Run, that's the one that's the good question because that's about movement. Can the fish that are moving back into this stream in one year's time move all the way back up? That I cannot answer. Um, it, it's a distance for them to move. There's some riffles and some, some things they got to get through. This will continue, this biological monitoring, until we know that system is restored. Is it going to be as complete as it's going to be this year? No. Because if we know things are recovered, we want to put our energy into those places that are not recovering the way we think they should. So that's what we're going to do. Do I know exactly what's going to happen? Absolutely not. No, no, no. Yeah. But it's not a mass kill of the entire system. It was Leslie Run, you have Bull Creek, you have North Fork. All these things are interactive because that's it's a watershed. These fish are going to move back into spaces. If, if the smallmouth bass, because they're kind of territorial, if it was booted out of its favorite fishing, ro whole fishing rock by a bigger bass and that bass died during the fish kill, well, it's back there and saying, yay, I got a free house. So the, the fish kind of move back in. So I, we, this is not the first spill we've dealt with. 
This is not the first complete fish kill. We had one in the Rocky River. Some, they were doing jewelry, and they dumped cyanide into a stream in Cleveland Metro Parks that had endangered rare fish in it. Killed every one of them. And we were all worried. We were like, oh, they're never going to come back. Next year, fish are coming back. So Mother Nature's pretty resilient if you don't keep kicking her. <laughs> so our job is to ask those questions. Your job is to make sure we're doing our job. And we'll talk about this. Remember, this happens June through October, so we really won't get results in until wintertime when we start looking at stuff. So we're not going anywhere, so we'll discuss what, what we find. And the same thing with the bugs. We're going to do the same work on the bugs. Right now, our bug work is just coming in so that we can eventually generate that, that table, that water quality report. We know from some of the places we've got some preliminary scores, the bugs are really good too. I did find some mayflies. So when we walked in, that was River Mile 1-9, probably around River Mile 2-5. So I'm now less than a, a mile downstream of where Sulphur Run came in. I was finding mayflies, which is a nice water quality indicator. There's a lot of black flies and coronamids, which are eh. And then tapula, those big crane flies that you get that you think are mosquitoes, they're babies, they're big, fat, ugly things. And we, I found some of those. So again, those are all things that are telling us everything's not dead in that creek, and Mother Nature is resilient. Our job, again, is to track it and see how it works out. So that's what we're doing there. So that's the ecological sampling. The one glaring thing that I can say we, we don't have lots of information, and that's part of this next phase. because. You know, the spill response is its own thing. We want to stop the spill and address the emergency. As we go into the phase that I'm going to be a bigger part of, which is this assessment phase, we need a lot more sediment data because we know stuff is still in the stream. If you go and kick a big rock downstream, you're still going to see some sheen there. The question we need to ask, and all of us, is what does that mean for the ecology of the system? What does that mean for the water chemistry? And oh, oh yeah. I, so we did. So actually, when you're talking about tracking, we call it tracking the plume. We did that in, in the second week of February. We tracked. So that's when it was highest. We tracked it, and we were still getting some sheen down in North Fork, Little Beaver, and then we walked it all the way back up. It doesn't go very deep. So because it's it's recent. So. So the cool thing about some of these streams are, one, it, in, in the Leslie run, because it has this grade, it doesn't build up a lot of sediment. So if you put in at where that trailhead is, there's a lot of gravel, a lot of boulders. You go further up, there were actually, it was the first, we, there were some nice pools of sediment. Um, but stuff doesn't really, when we were dancing around in there, we weren't seeing lots of sheen come out of those. What I, it's really weird, but what we've seen is you get these big boulders that are kind of, the slabs are built up this way. And if you walk up and down, you'll see there's these rocks that are just sitting in there. If you wiggle those, that's where really the sheen is. It's hiding in this biofilm underneath those rocks. So if you would flip one over, some of them are a little shiny. And that's, that's the sheen that's on there. So it's still there. And we need to start looking at long term, how much is there? And then the second question is, what does it mean? Because again, we have standards, we have ecological risk. We have to do all these things because that guides it. We do not, do not want to willy nilly go into a beautiful stream like Leslie Run as it gets lower and just dredge the stream. Because that is gonna do far worse things. Once you dredge a stream out, You've created a stream that now lost its floodplain, and it gets mad at you, and it's going to start eating property sideways to recreate a floodplain. And that's what the stream does. If that's your property <laughs> that's next to the stream, when it goes away because the stream is redoing what we took from it, it's not, it's not a good situation because folks don't like their property eroding. So we have to ask these questions. We don't know all the answers to that yet. Um, sediment sampling will continue. Dot, dot. Questions? Yeah, sure. Have at it. <laughs> here's the mic for the... What, what is the lab Sorry, here's the lab. <coughs> ETCH uses? What's the lab? It's called PACE. Yep. 
and yeah. Well, how come the detectable levels are different from PACE and a a ALS? Different companies have it. It all depends on the parameter. Detection levels are different for every parameter. Think of it. It it's. For some of these things, if you look at some of the, the, the glycols, if, if you actually watched our data, these glycols have weird detection limits. So think of it this way. You're asking a machine to de detect things at parts per billion, and that alone is pretty cool that they can do it. But different things in the stream can influence how that machine works. So if I take my glasses off, my detection limit for any of you is you're a blob. <laughs> because that's, that's a resolution. So when you look at some of these detection limits, there's a couple of parameters where they hop around in the same parameter. Uh, some will be 500 parts per billion, some will be down to five. That's, that's, no. No. Every, every lab. Why do we send it to the third party? Every lab has the ability to detect things. Our question when a lab gives us a detection limit does it have the ability to detect below a level of concern? If that level, let's say your water quality standard for something is five parts per million. And the lab says, my test methods say I can get to 10 parts per million. I'm sorry, that's not cool enough. We want someone that can get below that. So when we review detection limits, those are the things we look for. Does every lab have to be the same? No. So, yeah, so sulfur run, so Leslie run in our world, the upper part, so to where that turnoff is, so that upper part is what we call warm water habitat, which in our world means it's our expectation of any stream across the state of Ohio. As you get further down in Leslie run, it is marked as what we call cold water habitat. That is because it has an assembly of critters that live in there that like cool streams that are fueled by groundwater. So when we're talking about where are contaminants hiding out, what's going on, you're getting this, if you're getting a stream with this constant groundwater flushing through it, it is up, it's upwelling and moving things downstream. So they have different expectations in our world. When you go to sulfur run, in our water quality standards, we rate all these streams, Sulfur run is something called limited resource water, meaning what has been done to it over the years of culverting and impacts to the stream from what's gone on with land use has made that stream something we do not believe can support a healthy fish community. So we call it a limited resource water and we have no biological expectations like we have in the same thing in Leslie run. So in some ways, that's bad. That means us people have done something to a stream to make it not able to support our expectations. In the case of what's going on in relation to the spill and the cleanup, it also means that if you dredge Leslie Run, I'm going to be really sad because you're going to mess things up ecologically. If we have contamination in Sulphur Run and they're chasing it, it's Go for it, <laughs> because our, ex, our ecological expectations, therefore what applies in those rules, are different. So sulfur run still has stuff in it. We do not want it to be a continuous source of material, because the spill was not in Leslie run. It traveled down there. The spill was on the tracks, eventually went into sulfur run. We do not want that sulfur run part, so think upstream to where those north and south ditches entered, and along the railroad tracks, we do not want that to be a continuous source of stuff. So that's why all this excavation is going on. They're chasing the material that has been in the soil so we can get it out so that now we don't have a continuous source. And that, that's going to continue, and US EPA is in charge of that. When they run out of soil that doesn't pass their expectations and they hit whatever their clean level is, then they're done. And then our expectation is that the source will hopefully no longer be a threat to Leslie Run. This, is a, this takes time. This is not something that will immediately happen. There, there's a time limit for this. 
we're already seeing with fish coming back to Leslie Run, we already see ecological recovery. It's not perfect. Go for it. Yeah. The EPA, oh, the EPA in, in my understanding, is that you, not, not you, but EPA, they are doing side-by-side -side soil samples with Norfolk Southern. Or or whoever whoever is, I can I can address that. Yeah. yeah. Is that correct? So, uh, this the, and this is a follow up to Linda's question, but but basically you guys are talking about quality control, right? Um, how how can we ensure we have quality control of the samples that are being collected uh, by the Norfolk Southern contractor, right? So yes, um, twenty percent of the soil samples that were collected in the soil program were split samples. Okay. So that's an additional quality control measure. Um, in the drinking water program that Laura talked about uh, last week, thank you for being here again, um, they also collected side-by-side, -side, not split, but side-by-side -side samples um, to also verify um, uh, contaminant levels and, and make sure we have quality control. What, you what you're asking for and what Linda just asked for is, are we going to do some sort of split sampling um, in, uh, in the surface water? bodies, right? And then when we get to the sediment phase, will there be some type of split sampling? So um, here's what I'll tell you. Um, we do have some plans uh, that we're still going back and forth with the company on to finalize, all right? We will take these comments back um, for future sampling, all right? Right now, uh, we're not, as far as I know, we're not doing any split sampling, right? Um, but we hear your comments. Now, we do have uh, a, a ton of other quality control measures that we use Direct oversight, just like Bill described, uh, and we do that with uh, with all the media that we're sampling. We also um, do a thorough uh, review of the quality control reports uh, that uh, that are provided. Uh, so, so there are quality measures in there. Um, like Bill, I have never questioned the data because the data er that we've collected across all media has matched up really well. So I don't I don't question the data. The question I always ask is. How do we apply the data, right? And so that's where uh, that's really important for uh, the, the agencies to look at that uh, look at that data through you know a lens of protection of ecological health, protection of public health. I, I hope that makes sense. Yes. One more question. So I always see in newsletters that we get sent, you know, in our mail. Everything's good. Nothing's contaminated. But yet you're pulling out, not you, but but I'm they're pulling out contaminated soil and water. So I'm getting really confused by when I'm getting these letters, and these letters state there is no contamination. Then why are you taking water, millions and millions of water and soil out if it's, there's no contamination? Yeah, and, and we, we don't mean to imply that there's not a problem. We still have a lot of contaminated materials out there. The train derailment site itself uh, is still, uh, there are por portions of it that are still heavily contaminated, and we are still continuing, the company is still continuing to remove that under our oversight. There are portions of the creek, Bill mentioned it, Sulphur Run is contaminated, right? You go in there, you stir up the sediments. I go in there a couple times a week, and I stir up the sediments, and I see it, right? Um, but I, what I, I'm also, uh, like Bill, I'm also encouraged by, uh, by the, 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 the re rejuvenation of certain portions of Leslie Run. I was down in Negley um, uh, last week and walking, walking the stream backwards, and I was, I was compared, to, compared to February, it looks really good. But your concern is that we're painting a picture that everything's good, uh, and we, we recognize that there's still a lot of contamination out there. So uh, again, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take those comments to heart. Hey, Mark, I got two questions, and I promise I'll leave you alone. The one, the one question is, with this pit, and this is for you, yeah. the, the pit over there that's about ready to be excavated. The burn pit? Yes. Um, how much chemicals were actually encapsulated under that? So that, that's a good question. And actually, um, a good portion of the uh, northern part of the burn pit has been uh, worked on uh, this week. And um, uh, we've actually had to dig deeper there. Um, uh, there are, uh, there's an area where there's, an old, um, uh, there's some old clay piping. Uh, it, it's been damaged and crushed over the years, but uh, some old clay piping, piping under there. 
and we're actually seeing higher levels of contamination, so it's forcing us to dig even further down. Uh, so, so yes, um, we, we are seeing um, more concentrated contamination in that area. For sure. Number two question, since the storm drains run into the sulfur run, what was the air and water sampling is being done to see how much of the contaminants enter the drain and creeks and how much is still there and where can we see the results? Okay, um, slow that question down a little bit. Um, yeah, so uh, you're asking... What? I'm asking, I'm asking um, with, with the storm drains, I got, we got maps of the storm drains. Yeah. They obviously run into sulfur run. Right. Okay. Now here, what air and water sampling has been done to see how much of the contaminants enter these drains? Okay. How much, if any, is still there? And where can we see these results? Okay. So um, let's, let's, I'll talk about the air sampling. Uh, Bill, if you want to talk about, a little bit about the water sampling, if uh, you know off the top of your head. But, um, you know, we, we did the air uh, monitoring and sampling session a couple weeks ago. So, you know, we've got an extensive network of air, um, uh, air sampling around um, the derailment area um, out into uh, the city. And um, uh, in those areas, there are, uh, there are locations extremely close to um, storm, drain, uh, storm drain culverts, storm, storm drain entrances. You brought this, this is one of my follow-ups from last week. You brought up this question last week, and uh, we did go do some inspections of storm drains based on your recommendation. Uh, didn't see any, didn't see any concerns. The what? The mass. Oh, that's, that's, so that's, yeah, that's, that's, so um, one of the, one of the concerns we've heard from uh, you all this week, and uh, we're, <laughs> we're working on it, trust me, is dust issues, right? Yeah. So you're, yes, so we're seeing, uh, we're seeing increased dust because of the dry weather, because of the warmer weather, uh, uh, we get it. Uh, we're, 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 we're trying to figure that out. The mats are a, um, uh, when those particles are on the road and we're, the, the roads are being washed, you know, to keep the dust down, they're getting into the storm sewers and potentially clogging up the storm sewers. So do we, we don't want to, you know, create a, uh, a, a storm sewer backup so problem. So on the water side, we haven't uh, done any sampling in the storm drains, we, but we have done it in, in Sulphur Run. And yes, there's contamination in the sediments. Yes, the, uh, uh, the level of contamination in surface water has dr dramatically dropped. But when you stir up the sediment, obviously you're going to get, you're right, going to liberate contamination. So. Not as quickly, but it does break down. It does break down. To a certain extent. Yeah. I mean, um, but I was just saying what the water quality is okay. inside or drain. Yeah. So, let me, so in, in the big picture, when, when we're talking about the water quality in the storm drains, there, there's, there's multiple phases to this cleanup. And then there's the operations group, and their job is to chase down that contamination and remove it. I don't care where it is. <laughs> I don't care how they do it. Their job is to get it out. My part of this is to check the water quality in Sulphur Run, in Leslie Run, and downstream. So, uh, like, we went over Ohio EPA's website. The same stuff exists on US EPA's website. The data is out there. We put the lab reports there. I'm saying in the drain itself. And that, that's, what the, that's what the operations folks are going to look at, because they my... They don't even check that, then, as far as water. So we can do this by the, yeah. Uh, the sediments have been sampled in Leslie Run, but I couldn't answer the question, did we go up into the culverts and sample, uh, and sample those? I wouldn't see, I wouldn't expect to see any difference in contaminant levels. Even we from, know. Even from the trucks running up and down our road? I mean, listen, them, tr them trucks run up Taggart Street. Yeah. Them storm drains are right there on Taggart Street. Yeah. At the beginning, there was no, there was no wash off. We already yeah. know this by the contamination on the side of the roads and everything. What's keeping them contaminations from running down into the storm drains? And you know, so the the dust the dust that you're seeing are come, well. Let me take two steps back. Okay, all right. So on site, there are there are truck washes. Um, every truck that leaves that site uh, is pressure washed, washed down. The waste is sealed and the, the truck is tarped. So all that, all that <laughs> dust and, uh, and, and 
the dirt that's getting on the road is coming from the support zone areas and coming from other sources. It's not coming from on site. We, uh, we're very meticulous about ensuring and overseeing to ensure that, that uh, those, those trucks are washed off. So. And it's a it's a dust bowl out there. Yeah, now we we have I done. I videoed yeah. it. The trucks coming we know. out, dust is blowing everywhere. We know, we know. It's a problem, and, and we're working on it. Right. And your yeah. water trucks are consistent and keep it wet. I was just out yeah. there before I came. Dry as a bone. Yeah. No water truck in sight. I get it. I get it. So it, it's something we need to work on. So uh, we are, and uh, obviously it's not being done to your satisfaction. So so. Yeah. I get it. I get it. I understand. So we'll, we'll continue to work on this. You know, we're, we're long past the days when we could erode oil, you know, so, um, we, you know, so we, we understand. Uh, my question is more, it's back to the sampling methodology and split sampling of uh, the gain data. The macro invertebrate study that you're going to propose to study the biological community living in Leslie. Is that going to be somehow split sampled? Is it going to involve uh, the EPA professionals or a company that's going to uh, look at the bugs and tell me what's there? It's going to be both. So the, the way in the case of a, a spill response like this, when you're looking at these, these efforts, our goal is to make the person that's responsible pay for as much of this stuff as we can. So typically when we do these studies, there's, there's multiple levels of what goes on. They have to submit to us what is called a qualified data sampling plan. And that means someone that samples, it may be us, it may not be. In the case of what's going to happen, I'm going to assume it's going to be a, 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 le, a environmental consulting firm we've, we've worked with on multiple sites throughout the state of Ohio. They will submit uh, what we call a level three sampling plan. It's going to be what sites I tell them to monitor and what sites they want to add for, for their own information. And we don't split sample with that because that sample is its own unit. We get the data from that and we all review it. But there's very, uh, the, the way these things are analyzed, they're very strict controls. Does that mean Ohio EPA cannot go back at any point in time and do our own sampling. No. We will go back. So what well, I know is You good. can't go back in time when you're sampling. So that's no, the But first the, thing. the good thing is, I mean, good, bad. <laughs> Last year, we have that point in time before anything happened. So we have that benchmark reference. And going into the future, we now will gauge everything on what was it, and how is it recovering? Regardless of who is sampling, the judge of does it or does it not meet our standards, that is not going to change. Uh, sampling and identifying the organisms, if only done to the genera, is not exactly precise. Ohio EPA, and if you I read, know. and that is our metric. That is what we use, and that is that, not going to change. That's why the methodology, if it's just stream invertebrate sampling based on the stream uh, larvae, you should do the adults. Our methods are what we are going to follow, and that is purely based that's too bad. on aquatic insects. You should do the adults. Okay. Uh, yep. Uh, Maggie, and then um, let's see what time is it. So it's six after. Um, uh, we, we could take one, more, one or two more just, questions, and then oh. we can just talk individually. Uh, are you Rick? Yep. Okay, you, uh, Maggie first, then Rick, then Lindsay. I mean, Julie. Julie? 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 Yeah, Julie. Oh. I'm Julie. Oh, That's I okay. thought you were Maggie. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, I have a question. This might have been uh, gone over before. I yeah. apologize. But um, an open pool of water yeah. within the mile, you know, with the plume and everything. So um, the rain has come. It's probably um, diluted some of the toxins that were in there, the dioxins, I think. But anyways, um, to get that remedied, you're going to have to have a professional company come 
and it's all probability that it should be handled by a professional company to remove the water at a stagnant static pool, a swimming pool. I have a swimming pool. We've had the top of it removed. Um, we didn't have it on for this whole uh, derailment. So in all probability, there is contamination in the water, just from the plume. Um, I would think that that should be removed professionally, the water. Um, so I called, um, what's the local one? It's a um, Santa Pro. And they said that they're not going to touch anything in East Palestine because of Norfolk Southern. So I tried to call companies to have it done. Um, I think I have one guy might have might do it. It's going to cost about $600. Plus you have to get new water. But what I'm saying is, is that going to be um, a problem if it's not tested? I mean, in all probability, that is contaminated water. It's stagnant. It's sitting there. So how would that in your opinion, be handled best? Yeah, so in, in terms of contamination from contaminants that came off the derailment site, um, we've always said that uh, the initial screen is the phase one soil sampling program that we talked about three weeks ago. And we did, uh, we did not see any uh, increased levels of contamination that we wouldn't expect to see in typical urban and rural soils. Um, in addition to that, we looked for indicator chemicals in some of the uh, nearby surface water bodies and didn't see, uh, again, same thing, increased contamination. So our recommendation is to open your pool the way that you normally would because we would not expect to see a contamination burden in those water bodies, even those smaller water bodies. So, um, again, typical cleaning procedures that you would typically use. Yeah, I want it drained. Yeah, nobody's willing to drain yeah. it. Well, um, again, I – if – if you choose to drain the pool, um, I, I, I don't know what But to in all you. probability, you know, I'm like right there. I'm up on South Pleasant. Mm -hmm. So we're very close. So in all probability, you had that plume over this water, and it was there. It's been there since this whole problem came. Yep. So I, in all probability, I'm, I wouldn't want to be swimming in, like, dioxins are measured in parts per trillion. So in all probability, you have a chemical in there acetone, whatever, whatever it is, whatever it's conglomerated to be chemistry-wise. So I think safety-wise is I want to train professionally. I don't want to touch it. So I, I guess the only, again, we, we have to base our cleanup decisions on the information. That so we I should have it tested. Would you test it? So no, um, because, again, all the sampling that we've done to date has not shown that, that there's a problem. Yeah, and, but that doesn't mean there's nothing, and, nothing and in my it pool. Also doesn't, it also doesn't mean that if we collect your sample and we see five parts per quadrillion of a certain uh, chemical, which is about what you would see uh, in, a, in a typical small water body like that, um, we wouldn't, again, it, it, there's no way to determine whether or not that's coming from uh, the derailment site versus what is, what is typical. I don't have all I have the, a, All the background yeah. samples we collected also had – uh, levels of dioxin detected. So we're seeing it not only in uh, th those compounds at typical levels in this area, but also in the in But not in a pool. Again, you're missing my point. Um, we're seeing it. Um, so, yeah, we yeah. are definitely missing your yeah, point. Yeah, and we've, again, we've, we've looked in, in There shouldn't be there in regular pool water. There's no evidence that dioxin should be there. Again, it, it's ubiquitous in the environment you would expect to see that in any typical environment. But there should not be a level. It, it, the thing is, yeah. is, you say one thing, I say, let's get it exactly. tested. Let's right. see what's in there and then go from there. Yeah. We currently don't have plans to do that, so if that changes, we'll let you know. So, um, uh, other questions? I'll, I'll, I'll let you know what we found in the marketing and that's it. That's it for I'm not selling this here. Hi. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the burn pit? You said you did yeah. pull up some dirt, and mm -hmm. um, was it, is this just a rumor, or was it covered, or was it, tell us about the burn pit, if you would. So, um, I, was it covered? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know is when they reestablished the track, when they reestablished the track after the derailment, they did lay some ballast. Um, so, uh, ballast. You said ballasts? Yeah, well, train rocks, right? Uh, the rocks that go underneath the train tracks. So when they reestablished the tracks, uh, there was there were rock put there was rock put down. Um, in terms of rock put over the burn pit, you mean over over the tracks? I don't have an answer for you on 
uh, the actual pit itself. I'd have to check with our guys who were here that night. Okay. So I don't know the answer to that. And what was the criteria for um, who, why would you repair the tracks and leave the burn pit sit? So again, so what, I, what was the criteria well, for the order of yeah, doing that? Yeah, we, we knew there was a contamination problem along the entire length of track, right? I mean, so there was going to be a remediation regardless of what happened next. Okay. So, and did you, you said you dug up some of the burn pit? So we are in that, the, the excavation that's happening right now, um, actually it's probably past that area right now, uh, is, uh, is in the north, uh, one of the north areas where there was uh, one of those burn areas that happened, yes. And you said there were contaminants found? There's contaminants found along the entire stretch. Um, so we're what seeing, are the right, well, let me, let me explain uh, the, uh, the, uh, the distinction from the west side to the east side. From the west side, we had um, a number of non-hazardous cars plus the butyl acrylate car release, right? Those releases happened there. As we got further east, you got closer to the vinyl chloride problem, right? Um, and so um, on the west side, as that excavation happened, you get some off odors here and there, right, from the, from the butyl, because as, as we've talked about many times, the butyl has an odor threshold that's extremely low. As we've gotten further east, uh, now we're seeing um, the vinyl chloride area. We're seeing, uh, you know, uh, some low-level detections around those areas for vinyl chloride, so we, which we expect to see because that's where it was. And uh, as we've been digging down into that area, we are seeing some um, elevated contamination. So if the uh, what? Of vinyl what? chloride. Vinyl chloride. Mm -hmm. And um, is it a lot of liquid? A, a, no. a moderate amount of liquid? Not liquid. Uh, it contaminated soil. And what's the, um, someone talked about a depression or a swale next to the, nothing? There's a ditch. Okay. Yeah, the ditch, uh, the ditch is being dug out as well. Was there a concern with that, that the vinyl chloride may have? Um, uh, yeah, it, well, we're seeing it in the uh, rivers downstream, so of course it got into the ditch. Um, so it got in the ditch, got into sulfur run, got into lesser run, so yes. The answer is yes. And State Line Lake right there? Is it anything? Yeah, so State Line, I know there was some surface water sampling done there. Um, and again, I, I, don't have, I, I don't have the information for you right now, and so I'd have to I'd have to. No that sediment there. sample of State Line Lake? I, again, I'd have to check. Okay. Guys, and, so. um, uh, and what are the chances of it having gotten under there any of the industrial buildings there? Uh, that's the next stage. So good question. Very good question. So. Um, uh, as the uh, the tracks get finished, and actually we plan to do a uh, one of these information sessions on all things track related, so stay tuned for that uh, in the near future. Um, and it, it'll actually be more informative because we'll have a lot more information once we start that assessment process away from the tracks. So so stay tuned for that. But um, yes, uh, obviously uh, we want to uh, part of the the plans that are being uh, not distributed, um, developed, and uh, reviewed. Uh, is a full assessment of those areas. Uh, so, uh, so we'll be able to inform on the plans as well, you know, what, what the extent of contamination assessment will look like and so forth. So and those are more on the eastern part of the derailment uh, where the e vinyl all, chloride all, would all be? All four sides, yep. No, I mean, the buildings, there are buildings on the eastern area where the vinyl chloride would have spilled. With the, well, there is potential that they would possibly. North and, north and south, I think. I'm not, I'm not following you, Rick. Uh, you talked about mainly butyl acrylate being on the western part yeah. of the right and, and of the yeah. spill, mm -hmm. and so and vinyl chloride was more toward the east. Is that just correct? where the initial spills happened? But uh, as you know, I mean, as we know, it got in the ditch, got into the river. So there's there's contaminants uh, not just in those spe specific areas. Yeah, having never because the area is isolated by fence. Just as a question, those buildings are near where the vinyl chloride spilled. Uh, again, any, any again, there are buildings near the spill areas. Yes, I, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand. We are going to. Does everybody we are else going to, understand my question? We are, we yes. are going, we are, are going to uh, establish a full characterization assessment of those areas. All right. Last yeah. question. Yeah. Let's say you determine there is vinyl chloride under the buildings. Mm -hmm. What's the solution? Depends on uh, depends on the nature of contamination. For example, some some buildings um, you know, uh, there are uh, uh, there are. Um, Air stripping um, uh, techniques could take place. Uh, we've done uh, re uh, removal actions in the past where the buildings have actually come down. It just it just depends on uh, uh, the nature of the contamination and decisions that are made based on all the parties that are involved. So. Oh, I lied. One more question: How do you determine the how, how do you determine what volume of vinyl chloride may have gone under the buildings? How, how's that done? 
Well, again, it's all based on environmental sampling. That's the first step. So um, once we see the concentrations in soil, then we can make some um, uh, uh, reasonable estimates of what might be present. So again, uh, those assessments will answer a lot of those questions. So, and I know Lindsay has a question, so thank you. Um, the sediment sampling. I know, I think you sent me February 8th, like kind of yeah, preliminary yeah, results. Yeah. Do, do they have any more sediment sam sampling for the creek? Like what, I do what know, is in the sediment? Yeah, I do know that there was, there was a, a, a series of sediments collected, sediments collected, I think in March, but I'll let, I'll let Bill answer mm -hmm. that question. And then, then we'll, we'll wrap it up and we can take on individual questions after that. Sure. So like I said, the one area that we're really missing that, that detailed information on right now is sediment. There were three different rounds of sediment sampling. One initially, which was not as extensive, and then two more. Has there been anything current? No. Um, what are we doing now is every, every media that is sampled has to have a sampling plan developed, then has to have a quality assurance plan developed. That's where we are. And once that happens, then we have developed a sampling plan. Why is it taking so long to get the sediment results as compared to the results for everything else. Well, is it take it? it ha you have to have these plans. You have to have these prescribed actions to ask the questions. Initially, the the biggest concern is: Are the trains still on fire, and are we containing the spill? And those are the emergency response things. As we said, when it gets into the next phase, which is assessment, remediation, that's where we're at right now. That's why these plans are being developed to ask those questions. But wouldn't you want to, personally, I, whenever you guys say it's clean, clean is clean, I want to know what was in there because there's no possible way, understandably, you could get all of it out. So if I hit a corner in the creek that wasn't cleaned, how, how come you guys aren't taking samples now? Because as time goes on, the creek's going to get cleaner on its own. Uh, so you might miss something that was in there, and can you tell me, like, do you have, can you tell me what all was in there in the February 8th? I know you kind of gave me a general, but it wasn't like the full list. The, the results should be on For your, the sediment. Yeah, we can, we can get that information out. Yeah, Lindsay, I gave you uh, the list of all the positive detections, mm -hmm. right? Because I didn't want you to have to scroll through 50 pages right. of documents. So all the positive detections of what we saw in the sediments. But again, that was, that was early in the spill. It was only a couple samples. I know that there has been some sampling done since then um, uh, in, in sediment. I think in March. I, yeah. yeah. So I, there is more data out there. So we'll, we'll see if we can get, the, get our hands on that. One more. How... How do you respond to all of the like third party testing, the universities and stuff that are coming out with the stuff with their results and saying like it's not it's not great at all? Yeah, oh, it, so uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because um, I've personally looked at some of the third party data that's been pro provided to us, and uh, yeah, to date, um, the, the data that I've seen is does not look different uh, than uh, than the data that we've collected uh, from these third parties. Now, what we don't know. Uh, we don't know what their what their work plans were to collect that data. Was it just were they just out grabbing samples uh, indiscriminately? Um, were they uh, was it did they have specific data quality objectives that they were following? Um, again, we don't know that, but we we are always open to looking at uh, third party data. We just uh, we just got some third party data uh, an email from somebody who was collecting third party data. They said uh, they told us that they'd like us to take a look at their data. Happy to do it. Um, yeah, and, and again, I think it's. It, it's not that they are saying, uh, we are saying everything's good and they're saying everything's not good. We agree uh, that there is contamination in these areas. But the, um, uh, the way that they're describing the contamination, you know, for example, there's one third party individual that was uh, collecting water samples and trying to equate that to an air hazard, which to me is absurd, right? Um, you have to have air data to describe to determine whether or not you have an air, uh, air hazard. So, so again, how are you describing the hazard? So I, you know, you know we're not, you know, we're not having conversa direct conversations with these individuals unless they provide us with the data. So, so when they do, we'll look at it. Um, we're not afraid to look at it. It's still just, I, that's the main thing I worry. Like, I think you should step up your sediment sampling I, point taken. because it's, 
<laughs> point take, point taken, yeah. and just, and <laughs> well, yeah. Just to say, we just had our eco. We have a group, a bigger group of Dorking scientists that sit around the eco group, and that was the big thing we talked about yesterday. Because there's there's two challenges we have. One, while it's very easy to find sediment in Sulphur Run because it's a very silty stream. The same does not exist in Leslie Run and Bull Creek. Those are very rocky streams. Now, today we found some really cool sediment pockets in Leslie, but we have to come up with two techniques to ask that question because if a stream does like the, the, some of the stuff is hanging up under these rocks, that is not silt. When we talk sediment, it's that fine gooey stuff. That is not what we would sample, yet we know there's potential material in this place. How do we ask the question of that space? So we're going to have to have two different ways of asking questions. One, getting a jug of, 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 of silt, and that's, that's a very easy, very established technique. The second one is how do we ask the questions of these, these real cool streams that don't have a lot of sediment, that have a lot of gravel, like, like the lower parts of Leslie and Bull. The, there's these, this thing called a rheocrine. It's the stream beneath the stream. And that's where this stuff can hang out. But if we do a normal sediment sample, we're not collecting any of that because the lab's looking for those things bound to silt and clay. So that's what's being developed because we're looking at asking, what's in the water? When you walk on a stream, there's still water flowing underneath what you're stepping on. We have to ask the question of that, too, to get to your point of what is still here. Because that's, you're right, that is a big we don't exactly have all the information we need to make good decisions right now. And that's our next phase of assessment is to be going in there. So. Oh, very reassuring. Yeah. <laughs> and Bill, you, you, so. say, you say stock and you say things. Yeah. Uh, and you say things. Yeah. 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 So the, the contaminants um, that we're tracking uh, in, 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 the, uh, uh, in the waterways itself, it's a combination of butyloacrylate. There, there was some vinyl chloride. I don't know if we're seeing vinyl chloride. Uh, yeah, because it's, it's volatile. It, it uh, uh, volatilizes off pretty quickly. And um, some, some petroleum products. So that's, that's it. And uh, it's part of the family of petroleum products, yes. Absolutely. So we do, we've gone way over. Um, so, um, so again, we'll be back next week, 6 o'clock, public health session. Uh, we'll hang around for a little bit to, uh, uh, to answer some questions, if so. And um, thank you.